Hello, and welcome to our kickoff episode of season three of ARP in Brief, a practical video guide on handpicked arbitration issues. My name is Elizabeth Incapié, and I am part of the ARP in Brief team, practicing international arbitration as in-house counsel in Dusseldorf, Germany. It is my great pleasure to be moderating today's episode on unique unicorns, in-house counsel sitting as arbitrators, featuring Laura Abrahamson, who for over 25 years worked as in-house counsel at a publicly held multinational corporations such as ACOM. Currently, she is a full-time arbitrator and mediator. Lara Hamoud, Associate General Counsel, Legal Disputes and ADR at Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, Etna. Lara is an arbitrator in both civil and common law jurisdiction. She is currently a member of the ICC International Court of Arbitration. And Keteman Meskishvili, who is a legal counsel at GSC, Georgian Energy Development Fund. She is a guest lecturer at the Free University of Tbilisi and also serves as an arbitrator. We will post more detailed bias for our unicorns in the chat so that you can see more about their background and accomplishment. Here, some housekeeping remarks. This episode will last 45 minutes and will be recorded. For this reason, your camera and your microphone have been deactivated. For all of you attending live, we will have a follow-up Q&A session that will last 15 minutes and will not be recorded to offer all of you and our panelists a more private forum to share ideas and experiences. The recordings will be uploaded to our website, Spotify, and YouTube. If you don't want to miss any episode, you might subscribe to our channels to be timely informed about next episodes and once we upload the recordings. Looking at the large number of persons attending, I am confident to say that the topic is a hot one. So let's start as we have plenty of experiences and advice to share with you. Often, when thinking of arbitrators, we rather imagine someone working in private practice and seldom we do imagine that an in-house counsel will be an ideal candidate to arbitrate a dispute. When we add the gender diversity aspect into the equation, we immediately realize that this image of the female in-house arbitrator is rather a myth than a reality, similar to an unicorn. In this episode, we would like to speak with our distinguished panelists about their career paths and how they managed to become unicorns, this hard to find, but indeed mm -hmm. existent type of arbitrators. Thank you, Lara, Ketevan, and Laura for being here with us today and for your willingness to share your stories with us as a form to encourage the international arbitration community to address diversity from different perspectives and to show the in-house counsel and especially female colleagues that a career in arbitration is possible and the evidence is the successful ones of our unicorns. The first question coming to my mind are related to the beginning of your careers as unicorns, meaning obtaining that first appointment while being in-house counsel. Laura, your first appointment was made during your time as head of litigation at ACOM. Will you share with us how did you become an arbitrator? Sure. First of all, thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, for inviting me to join such a distinguished panel and, and talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I really appreciate what Urban Brief is doing. Um, I had been very active in-house in managing the international arbitrations I was involved in from attending the very first procedural conferences all the way through um, any hearings including taking some witnesses in some of them. And I'd worked very closely and partnered with the outside lawyers on my matters. I'd also been very active in attending international arbitration conferences and speaking on some panels. And um, right around 2012, 2013, after I'd been doing this international arbitrations for about 15 years, um, David Rivkin, who I work closely with on a number of cases, suggested that I might want to apply to the Court of Arbitration for Sport to become an arbitrator. And so I um, approached my general counsel because I thought that the, the sport would be a, a particularly good choice for me, given that they're usually one day arbitrations or two day arbitrations. And, and I could do those while, well, without Im impacting my day-to-day uh, -day job too much. And the general counsel was very supportive. And so I applied to be on the court of arbitration for sport. Um, 
at a time when I think the the first of the diversity initiatives was really kicking off. And um, I got my first appointment, um, in fact, through the, the, the AAA, because in the U.S., any of the doping cases um, where the sanctions are appealed by an athlete at the first level, um, the arbitrators appointed have to be cast arbitrators. So that was was my start. Um, and uh, and I continued from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, Ketaban. So you are the one facing the actual challenges of becoming an arbitrator and creating a brand around yourself in an extreme competitive market, uh, making it a bit harder <laughs> to become an unicorn. What do you think that are the features that led you to your first appointment? Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, first of all, I must express my deep gratitude to Arbin Brief and everyone involved in organizing this event and of course for the opportunity to be in the presence of such esteemed speakers. I'm confident that all of us, and of course, including myself, will have the opportunity to gain valuable insights from Laura and Lara on the art of building a personal brand, conquering obstacles, and ultimately achieving success as an arbitrator, even being a unicorn. So in returning to your question, it re reflects, uh, uh, I would like to reflect on your introduction. For me, as a woman in my early 30s, based in quite conservative country, and of course, being an in-house counsel, venturing into this very competitive market uh, as an arbitrator poses its fair share of uh, obstacles and hurdles. However, I believe that I have devised uh, a strategy that could tackle these issues. So firstly, uh, the, my objective is to be committed to ongoing learning and professional development that could differentiate me from the, uh, from the rest. And second, gaining expertise in specific area of law can be essential. So to go back to my first component, I'm able to provide some personal illustrations. Uh, as you mentioned, I worked on multiple projects involving the development of infrastructure and energy generators in Georgia, especially in Georgia. And whilst doing so, I observed that many project agreements are governed by English law because various investors, whether international or local, find it more expedient uh, when investing in Georgia. So in addition to being a licensed attorney here in Georgia, I decided to pass the solicitor's qualifying examinations in order to be able to be admitted as a solicitor in England and Wales. So I'm of the opinion that possessing the opportunity and requisite qualifications to approach legal issues from both civil and uh, common law perspective will enhance my prospect of being seen as a suitable candidate for the role of an arbitrator whilst being a unicorn, as you just mentioned. So regarding the second aspect, namely having uh, expertise in particular legal fields, before joining Energy Development Fund, I worked for three years in fintech industry. So my understanding of this uh, rapidly expanding and yet quite niche area of law I think played a pivotal role in my first appointment as an arbitrator because the dispute involved the fintech companies and the IT companies and so on. Well, I cannot, of course, disclose any more details than that. So I cannot uh, emphasize more the importance of being lucky and attending uh, the networking events, etc. So to summarize, this is my experience and this is how I, I got my first appointment as an arbitrator while serving as an in-house counsel. This is really helpful, thank you. Lara, um, so according to your experience and your road, because this is a bit longer, um, to your first appointment, which characteristic do you think can play today a decisive role into the appointment of future unicorns? Thank you, Elizabeth, and hello to everyone. Uh, many thanks to Arvin Brief for inviting me and uh, to Elizabeth and Emily for the organization. Uh, I'm flattered to be called a unicorn. I take it as a, as a compliment. Um, and to answer your question, Elizabeth, unlike Laura and Ketevan, I was I had my first appointment before I joined uh, you know, the, my employer as in house. Um, and uh, I um, was lucky enough to uh, have been allowed by my uh, partner then, later Manuel Gaillard, uh, to uh, act as administrative secretary. And uh, back then I was proposed as administrative secretary by um, the chair who knew me from a, a previous um, uh, employment. 
And after that, um, the institution got to know me and uh, appointed me in a small uh, arbitration case. And here again, Emmanuel Gaillard allowed me to take that role. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because, uh, you know, not all law firms or international law firms are quite are flexible uh, for conflicts, uh, you know, of interest considerations as simply as that. So I got lucky and from my first appointment, which was a, a small case, I then got others and uh, there we go. And then when I moved as in-house, then obviously it was easier for me to continue my role, easier than it is for Ketevin and, and Laura, or it was for Ketevin and Laura. Now, to answer your question more specifically, for in-house counsel, I think what, what you know, an in-house counsel may want to emphasize to get appointment is first to market himself or herself as a dispute lawyer, as opposed to an in-house counsel only. And that goes back to what Laura was saying when she said that she was very heavily involved in the arbitrations. So you have to you know, promote yourself as a dispute lawyer and hang out with the arbitration community. And, and it's easy actually when you're a user because, because there are plenty of opportunities for users. The dispute resolution community, the institution, they want to hear about users. So go and provide your input as user, but as a dispute resolution lawyer, not only or as in-house. And then make sure you make the community aware that you are available to act uh, and, and as arbitrator, even if you are an in in-house, because it's not usually, you know, um, you know, uh, something that uh, the community would think of necessarily. So say it, um, and obviously always highlight the advantages, you know, of uh, having an in-house as arbitrator. And then more generally, for the benefit of all the young practitioner who are maybe uh, on on the on the, uh, on the on the call today, um, you know, when you want to have your 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 appointment as arbitrator, I always advise you know the, the young practitioners to distinguish themselves as much as they can from others in in the jurisdiction in which they are practicing. So. It can be a language that you speak uh, um, or you can work uh, with in a jurisdiction where that language is not, you know, uh, common or it can be your legal education, you know, your background. You are in a common law jurisdiction, but you're a civil lawyer and hence, you know, you're, you're, you're different. Um, you, it can be your industry expert. As in-house, we're very often kind of expert in an industry and that's something that we can uh, you know, we live by it day by day. So that's something that we can also put uh, to the table. And also past experience, you know, you, you have spent five years in China and you moved to Europe. So use that knowledge that you got from your, you know, experience, knowledge of that jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many ways to distinguish yourself. And I think these are the considerations that, um, you know, should be, I think, uh, looked at or thought of uh, for for a first uh, appointment. In addition to what Ketevan and Laura had had mentioned, has have mentioned already. Thank you, thank you very much, Lara. Um, yeah, I think that those are very very good advice uh, for future unicorns. And uh, now I would like to speak um, about the added value that in-house counsel sitting as arbitrator might bring into arbitration. For example, um, we have heard that um, cost and time effectiveness is not that present any longer in arbitration proceedings. Um, often we also heard that um, arbitrators are doing a poor job uh, managing uh, proceedings or even if doing a good one, they fail to recognize the needs of the users. Um, for this reason, I would like to ask you, Ketevan, if you believe that in-house counsel sitting as, as arbitrator could streamline the solution to the current discomfort that users of arbitration are experiencing and give more visibility to their needs? Oh, well, uh, 
First, I would like to uh, highlight the role of in-house counsel as I see it. So I really think that being an in-house counsel is comparable to being the first line of defense. So your main responsibility is to administer and defend your organization as eff effectively and efficiently as possible. So in that regard, as an in-house counsel, I tend to view arbitration awards and the arbitral process in general, not only as a means of resolving a dispute between two specific parties, but also as an opportunity to learn about the weaknesses and the set line of defense, to develop policies and implement revised risk management systems. So it could be said that sometimes these concerns of an in-house counsels as the end users of the process may not always be addressed in the most practical manner. Therefore, uh, I can say that I agree with the, with the observation made in your question, but not with criticism, but by shifting the focus to a different aspect, specifically the fact that the in-house counsels could sig significantly streamline the process. And what I mean by that is that the principal advantages of an in-house counsel are their specialized knowledge and experience in particular business, their awareness of industry-specific challenges, and their general way of approaching and managing legal issues. So for instance, uh, and definitely in my personal experience, in-house counsels are typically very mindful of budgetary considerations, for example, and cost effectiveness. So when serving as arbitrators, they may be more inherently inclined to adopt streamlined and cost-conscious procedures, which can benefit the parties involved. So in-house counsels also understand the practical needs and priorities of business and industry in general, and this user-centric perspective that the in-house counsels ha inherently have can translate into a more tailored approach to arbitration proceedings and ensuring that the process aligns with the party's initial intentions, their objectives and preferences. Of course, all of this within their authority granted uh, to the arbitrators by the parties. So to, to answer it briefly, yes, I do, I do think that in-house arbitrators could significantly streamline this process. Um, Lara, I, I saw you, you were <laughs> nudging with your head. Um, do you also agree that you also are bringing some um, tailor-made proceedings according to the to the to all the advantages that you have learned being an in-house counsel? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with what Ketaban just said, and in fact, I often tell the story that in my first week um, in-house at Occidental Petroleum, the COO came and sat in my office and said, I just want to make sure you understand what your job is. I said, okay, John, tell me what my job is. And he said, your job is to, um, Matt, you know, to manage your docket to avoid shareholder wealth destruction. And what he meant by that was every, and he said, every dollar we spend on as a publicly held company on whether it's outside counsel fees or arbitral fee, institution fees, settlements or judgments or awards against us, all impact on the shareholder value and 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 impact the bottom line such that um, you know your job is to manage the entire process to keep the total amount spent as low as possible to minimize the shareholder wealth destruction. Um, and for many businesses who are going into an arbitration, you know, the time it takes to get to an award and the cost it takes to get there may end up dwarfing what the business needs are. And so it may be more important for them to get a faster resolution um, and a cheaper resolution than ultimately all the points of, of, of what the judgment says of what's right or wrong. Um, and I think that as in-house counsel, that's one of the reasons we have the sensitivity to the budgetary issues that, that Kat event mentioned. Um, while I was still in-house and actively participating in arbitrations, I would attend those first procedural conferences because when you set the schedule and I would push for shorter hearings, you know, my first, uh, uh, hearing I attended for AECOM, uh, you know, in the construction in industry, the, the fallback was to have a four week or a six week hearing. And I remember saying, why can't we do this in a week or 10 days? Um, you know, the truth is, if you stretch a hearing for a month, the costs are going to exponentially increase and the time it takes to get to a hearing is going to exponentially increase. Um, but as in-house counsel, we have the ability to help make those cost benefit trade-offs in schedule. Um, by participating in those um, early procedural conferences. And then 
as an arbitrator, because of my 25 years in house, I'm very sensitive to the business needs. I take an active role in managing the calendar and managing the process with that in mind. And I encourage parties to streamline, um, set as early a hearing date as possible. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think the arbitrations are meant to be flexible. They're meant to be party driven, but you can creatively help parties find ways to, to be more efficient. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. I am really happy to hear that it's not only a myth that in-house counsel bring a completely new set of skills and perspectives that might result in an additional benefit, not only for arbitration itself, but also for the users to help them to improve or reshape internal processes and guidelines. However, and after hearing all these advantages of appointing an in-house counsel as an arbitrator, I am kind of troubled to acknowledge that diversity has not really pierced international arbitration in terms of career paths combined with gender. Lara, why, what do you think is the reason for the mismatch we see in international arbitration in regards to nomination of in-house counsel? So, um... And so it goes a little bit to what we said earlier. So generally, the appointment of in-house counsel, as you said, um, is not something that is common. And as you said, we, you know, unicorns and, and it's rare. So, but if we want to understand why, we need to look first at um, you know, the 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 companies, not many companies, as far as I know have dispute resolution departments. So usually in-house counsel are more corporate lawyers or perceived as being general, you know, law, like general competence um, uh, lawyers. And so, you know, you don't, you wouldn't, you know, naturally go to a corporate lawyer if you're looking for an arbitrator because you would go to a dispute resolution lawyer who has worked and knows the procedure and who's familiar. So that's one, I think, kind of like challenge. And then um, the other thing also, very practically speaking, not many companies allow their in-house counsel to do that. You know, I know I've heard of, of in-house counsel who say, oh, you know, you know, it's good you can do it. So that's also a, another uh, reason. But so it goes both ways, actually. You know, there are, there like, having been many in-house counsel exposed for the reasons I've mentioned. So automatically, the community does not necessarily pick in-house counsel or naturally think about in-house counsel. So I think all this can um, explain or, you know, to give some reasons as to um, the fact that you don't have many in-house uh, counsel who are picked um, as, as arbitrator, if that makes sense. And yeah, completely. If I, if, could I just jump in and add one thing? There? For the in-house counsel in our audience who, who really do want to uh, become the unicorn, and hopefully it won't be a unicorn 10 years down the line, um, you know, one way to... to to really get out there, as I think Laura alluded to earlier, is, you know, if you, as in-house counsel, you often have the opportunity to speak on panels. People want to hear from the users. And by putting yourself out there and speaking at the various international arbitration conferences or events, you know, you will be able to demonstrate that you, in fact, are a disputes resolution lawyer, that you have that experience um, and make the context of networking that is necessary to get those appointments. Because I think it's both a matter of demonstrating your expertise and networking that, that leads to that. So um, because there, because people do have that perception of in-house counsel, and frequently they are in many companies, more generalists, more corporate lawyers, but some companies like oil and gas companies uh, where I was or, or energy and construction companies and others do have enough disputes that they have dedicated dispute resolution professionals. And so getting out and um, showcasing your expertise with dispute resolutions by accepting invitations to speak at conferences um, is a great way to to go about that. 
Yeah, you are completely right, uh, Laura and also Lara, um, because I know here in Germany, um, when I was uh, being co-chair of the D40, we were all the time searching for in-house counsel to speak at our, our conferences, and it was hard to find. But uh, maybe they are listening to us and <laughs> wanted to to come and, and speak more often in conferences. Um, but Laura, um, I understood what Lara just explained, why in-house counsel are not often appointed as um, arbitrators. But why do you think that this share reduces even further down when we are seeing, when we are speaking about female in-house counsel? Um, do you think that it's rather because the female in-house counsel don't want to have the two jobs plus uh, private life uh, inconveniences? Or do you think there are other reasons behind? I think I, I think it's a it's a complicated question and has a complicated answer, Elizabeth. I think there's multiple strands here. But first of all, I think that the fact that there are fewer female in-house lawyers um, acting as arbitrators, you know, unfortunately, I think still reflects the fact that if you look at the ICA gender diversity last update study, you know, across all of the, the major institutions, the percentage of women appointed as arbitrator is still you know, less than 40%. I think the highest institution was was 35% in 2021 in terms of appointments. So I think that as a rule, women are being appointed, you know, a quarter to a third of the time, if or less, as their male counterparts. Um, so I think you have that issue playing into the fact that there are even fewer women lawyers. And I think that, you know, um, but I but I don't think that the fact that women have, you know, uh, dual responsibilities, um, you know, at their their jobs and at home is a reason not to appoint them as arbitrators. I think um, I think many women, you know, are are eager to uh, when they're in house to expand their 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 experience and build their their skills and want to take those appointments and and you know. If you want something done well, give it to someone who's busy uh, because they'll get it done efficiently. So I don't think that should be a deterrent to appointing women. But I think I think women are still facing that uphill battle in, in getting appointments, period. And uh, thankfully, with with groups like Arbitral Women and the Pledge for Equal Representation and Real, we're seeing real efforts to to keep those numbers going up. And hopefully they'll go up for in-house counsel as well. Yeah, let's hope for this. Ketevan, so you are currently consolidating your unicorn career. What do you think that the actors of arbitration could do to promote and include more female in-house counsels like you in their list or in their actual appointments? Well, indeed, I'm very, at a very interesting stage of my career. I'm currently consolidating my career as an in-house counsel and as an arbitrator. And yes, it's quite challenging. As for the question itself, yes, it's quite complex. And reflecting on what Lara and Laura just said, uh, I think promoting the inclusion of in-house counsel, counsels, uh, especially female counsels in arbitral institutions, lists and appointments requires a joint effort involving in-house counsels themselves, firstly, uh, willing to serve as arbitrators, the institutions themselves, and the parties involved, parties at large involved. So first of all, I think it should be us, the unicorns, the female unicorns, who should be very vocal about the advantages of ha having in-house counsels as arbitrators. And there are many as were just highlighted by, by my colleagues. So having said that, uh, I'm extremely grateful to our being brief even for this opportunity and for pioneering this topic. Uh, as for the ar arbitral institutions, I think they can engage in targeted outreach efforts to raise awareness about the benefits of appointing in-house counsels as arbitrators. So this could in involve organizing seminars, workshops, conferences, specifically addressing this, uh, specifically addressing this topic and highlighting the advantages of having in-house counsels as arbitrators. Uh, from a more practical perspective, I think arbitral institutions could be open to provide specialized training or certification programs even for in-house counsels who also wish to act as, as arbitrators and make careers as an arbitrators and as a unicorns that were mentioned numerous times you know, during this uh, uh, event. So this uh, 
these kind of opportunities really could have a twofold effect. First, this can help address any perceived uh, gaps in the procedural experience of uh, expertise of e-house councils, and most importantly, build confidence of e-house councils in their capabilities. Let them believe that they can be e-house councils and also act as an arbitrators very effectively in both positions. As for the parties, I think it's up to the parties as well and up to the community at large. The parties, including their legal advisors, can actively consider in-house counsels as their potential arbitrators when making their selections. They have arguments and they have uh, they know about the advantages. So what's left is a shift in the mindset to recognize these advantages and this unique perspective that in-house counsels could really bring to the to the arbitration process in general. So to 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 summarize what I just said, I think it's a it's a joint effort of institutions. Uh, the parties, the legal community at large, and uh, and it starts with us, the unicorns, being very outspoken about the advantages of having in-house counsels as arbitrators. Wow, thank you, thank you. There's a lot of work to do in the arbitration community, Crazy. but that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so, um, Lara were, was mentioning before um, that uh, some in-house counsel are not even able, for example, to work as an arbitrator. And we often hear that there are some challenges for um, in-house counsel to really serve as an arbitrator. Um, for example, that the due diligence that not only include the conflict check, but also another formalities. Um, I would like to confront your experiences with this uh, hearsay. Um, for example, um, Ketevan, in relation to your employer, there are any requirements you need to observe in order to be able to serve as an arbitrator? Uh, well, there are no specific, even though I work for Georgian Energy Development Fund, with, which is a stay, fully state owned uh, investment vehicle with inherent restrictions that are also highlighted and included in my employment contract, there are no specific limitations in my employment contract or otherwise preventing me from serving as an arbitrator. However, it is my strategy and for the sake of keeping order that I always declare with my employer that I'm being appointed as an arbitrator and also make sure that the employer is aware, aware of the fact that there is no conflict of interest or, ground, or any ground at this stage for any potential conflict of interest. So yes, even though I work for a quite a, uh, a quite specific company, I, I don't really encounter any problems or objections from my employer from, from legal perspective to act as an arbitrator. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite free to act as one. That sounds amazing. Yes. Lara, sorry? Yes, it is amazing. Yes, <laughs> at, at this stage, there are no, no limitations preventing me. So yes, I'm grateful for that. So Lara, um, Nowadays, all corporates have a lot of compliance programs uh, in place. Um, in your case, do you need to perform any kind of, of clearings uh, through this program before you accept any appointment as arbitrator? So it's not really like a compliance program. I, I think... As Ketevan, Ketevan said, there's there's no limitation, but you need to make sure that you're not doing any activity that would be a conflict to your uh, basically activities within your employer, right? You can't be doing any external activity that would be conflicting your job with your employer. So what is usually required, and that's at least in, in my organization, is that the clearance from a compliance perspective, and, and yes, there, there is like a compliance requirements and you want to inform and disclose the fact that you act as arbitrator and you want to commit that you're not going to take any uh, case that would be in conflict with, uh, you know, your uh, own basically activities on uh, in your organization. And then once it's cleared um, and then you commit it, then obviously each case, uh, it will be for you to uh, make sure that uh, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're doing what you committed uh, to. So that's what, what I'm experiencing. Great, thank you. Um, 
Laura, um, my experience um, is a bit uh, different, um, especially here in Germany, um, that a lot of employers are not really happy to accept their in-house counsel sitting as arbitrators. What will you recommend to potential unicorns um, to convince their employees to see the value in allowing them to sit as arbitrators in case that they are not that generous as, for example, as Kitevans and Lara's employers? I, I think um, some of the arguments I used uh, back in the day to convince my, uh, my general counsel, and I was very lucky that um, I was successful, but I think they're, they're real arguments is, you know, it's, if, if anyone's seen the musical Hamilton, it's being in the room where it happens. I think you gain a lot of insight by serving as an arbitrator into what actually is going to matter. You know, a lot of the, the things people spend time and money on in preparing their cases um, may or may not end up being relevant to the determination the arbitration panel ultimately makes. And I think the experience of, of sitting um, in the seat of an arbitrator and the discussions you have with your fellow panelists provide incredibly valuable insight to corporations for um, their future matters. And you know, when you when you have had the experience and understand um, how certain witnesses are going to come across to the to the arbitrators, how certain experts might come across to the arbitrators, whether they appear to be too biased or too wedded to their clients' positions to be credible whether particular documents or, or, or arguments are persuasive, um, all of that um, helps you uh, prepare and, and strategize and deliver better results in your other cases. And so um, it also gives you valuable insights for, for appointments you might want to make in the future um, when you get the opportunity to, to understand how your fellow panelists think. So I, I think there are real advantages to corporations by allowing their in-house counsel to sit um, for, for their, not just for the, the that in-house counsel's um, development, but also for the company as a whole. Right, so um, I'm taking notes definitely. <laughs> um, so, um... Just speaking about the conflict check, because this is a, a big issue for in-house, but also for um, um, arbitrators just working in private practice. Um, I would like to know on a practical perspective, for example, Ketavan, how do you perform your conflict check, especially because I guess that you don't have a back office that run it for you? That's correct. I don't have a back office. And in all truthfulness, conducting the conflict check without a back office is a significant effort. At least it is for me. Because in that regard, I take a two-step approach. First, I conduct checks on the parties and their legal representatives, law firms, in relation to myself. And then I do the same checks for from the perspective of my employer so that there are no conflict checks whatsoever, uh, co conflict in relation to myself as an arbitrator and also as my with, in relation to my employer. So since so far I have limited experience arbitrating cases, the former is relatively straightforward for me. And I have also devised certain algorithms that proven to be very helpful for, for me personally. So my first step is that I start by compiling a list of all parties involved in the arbitration proceedings, including the claimant, respondent, any other parties who may intervene. And also I identify their legal representatives and the law firms uh, involved. Then I go to my second step. I move, move forward with my second step, which is collecting detailed information about each party and their legal representatives. And this should, uh, includes names and any known affiliations or relationships as common projects that we might have done in the past. So from, from my practice, this uh, second step has revealed, for example, that one of my course mates out of 1,000 students at Tbilisi State University was one of the representatives of one of the disputing parties. So I chose to disclose this information to both parties and address the parties uh, with this information. I was not challenged based on that. I based on that. I was given green light. However, this is something that my first, uh, my second step revealed, and uh, I, I I chose to disclose. And my final step, after making all this list and compiling this list, I conduct a manual review of any known relationships or connections between the parties and 
uh, their legal representatives with myself and my company. And this includes any past collaborations or professional associations. And this is very important. And this is the step I highlighted the most uh, because in, in Georgia, where I practice mostly, a legal circle is quite small. So you should be very careful, careful about all these parties involved when doing these checks. Uh, I also learned to maintain thorough records of the conflict check process, including the steps I've taken uh, and the information I've gathered and any potential conflicts identified, because uh, as the process goes on, I feel more safe having, uh, I, I feel more safe knowing that I have all these checks done and I have all these records and at any time there could be any issue, I can easily consult them and find the relevant information therein. So regarding the checks in relation to my employer, then I go to my company and request internal information about the company's procurement, contractors, suppliers, and investors. Since I avoid to act as an arbitrator in energy-related disputes, it's a bit easier in my case. Uh, however, I always try to spend some extra time at the office to make sure that there is no basis for any conflict of interest by exhausting all this available data that we store internally. Uh, as of now, and of course, this is also attributable to the fact that I have not worked in hundreds of cases. I have not yet utilized external assistance from law firms thus far, but as the number of appointments uh, will grow, and hopefully they will, I see I will see this uh, assistance for external assistance from law firms as a, a very useful resource. So I might have to go back to them and ask for, to perform these checks for me. However, I, at this moment, I cannot really say that I have this experience, even though I find it very helpful for the future. Wow, so that, this is uh, that the summary of the process I go through every time I hear that about it. sounds a bit burdensome. <laughs> uh, Laura, um, do you think that in those cases of um, doubts that they, for example, the IBI rules, can be of assistance for Ketevan and so to to decide if a case should be uh, disclosed or not. You know, I think um, you know it's interesting because the IBA rules don't really address our situation at when we're in-house counsel. Um, but I think you can, by adapting them and working with them, they do provide touchstones and guidance. So, you know, they're talking about clients and obviously when you're the in-house counsel, you're the client usually, but I think, if, I think they can be a good reference for, for in-house lawyers. I mean, Laura, would you agree? Do you, do you, you look to the IBA? Yes, absolutely. I, like I think they are a reference because there isn't, you know, much out there uh to guide in-house then i think the you know that's a reference that can can go to um to kind of get some guidance absolutely um So um, as we don't have much time yet, um, I would like to finalize this extreme fruitful and highly informative kickoff episode of season three with some brief advice from all of you to future unicorns. If you can just restrict it to few words, it will be ideal. So um, Ketaman, do you want to start? Well, I, I think I'm the least uh, desirable person to start giving advice when we have uh, Lara and Laura on this panel. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm also here to learn from their experiences as well. And I never exaggerate when I say that. However, from my experience, and I, I, I think this is the lesson I, I've learned recently, and from, from my perspective, that's a very important lesson, is the fact that for, for a very long time, I've held the opinion that uh, these opportunities will be readily available for me if I uh, work on myself, on my personal development, and I have these qualifications in different jurisdictions and different universities. However, from what I've learned from my experience is that if it's very important to put yourself out there, to be vocal about the fact that you would like to be an arbitrator, even being a unicorn, and participating in these networking events and conferences and using every opportunity you are potentially given, so this is something that I've learned myself, and I, I'm really eager to share to, to publicly that that that's something I've I've decided that even though I'm I could be a shy person naturally, I should overcome this and I should be more open to at these networking events and opportunities. And this is where you get recognized, and this is where you can say that yes, I'm a unicorn and I'm eager to work as an arbitrator. 
So I think that's limited advice to to to, to the uh, participants. Lara, do you want to con to continue? I think uh, I think you know I totally agree with Ketevan. I think um, one you know idea. Um, and maybe one more general um, kind of um, of uh, you know sharing of my my a bit of my experience. So I, I would encourage um, the in house who would like to um, have a, a, an appointment maybe to get a mentor. Um, you know I. Um, it happened to me, I had, a, you know, a young practitioner who wanted to become an arbitrator and she contacted me. And, and I think among female, we should be even more supportive. And she contacted me and, um, you know, asked if I could kind of guide her and, and support her. And uh, she attended, a, you know, a couple of hearings and, uh, um, and, you know, we were in contact, and 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 this lady today is is a very successful uh, lady who's appointed as as arbitrator uh, very often. And so, just to give you an example, this is an idea. I think we are there to support. We should be supporting, you know, the the younger and uh, and those who are really willing. Um, and so don't hesitate to contact someone who you would like to get guidance from and explain. Um, that's that's an idea, a, a tip. And, and and something maybe more general, you really need to like and be passionate about it because it's a lot of work. I mean, and that's also maybe one of the reasons, you know, there aren't many because it's you already have a full-time job and then you're having a second and then Laura was mentioning the third earlier as, as, as a female uh, when you have a family. And so it's a lot of work and you need to be really passionate about it and you need to do it for an, with an objective in mind, right? So it's either you don't want to give up because you've started it before like me and, and you, you are going towards a transition um, or you do it because you really enjoy doing it and you want to do it uh, with also like your discipline, uh, you know, knowing how to also limit yourself. So again, I'm repeating myself, but it, you need to be passionate. It is rewarding, but it's a lot of a lot of work. It's uh, a lot of work, Laura. Can I yeah, can I just add? Um, that I think the mentoring idea is really important and, and critical. But for people who may feel hesitant to reach out to just a woman arbitrator they've seen on a panel or or they've met. Arbitral Women has a formal mentoring program. And I would encourage you, if you haven't joined Arbitral Women, join Arbitral Women and sign up. I, I forget what the timing is. It, it's done yearly. And if, if if the timeline is passed already, I think it might have passed in uh, this month. Sign up for the following year and, and get on the list to, you know, to do it. I mean, obviously, asking someone directly like, like Lara had the experience of, uh, maybe it, it is a great way to do it. But if if you're too hesitant to do that, sign up through a formal mentoring program. I mean, and, and as I said, I think the, the two things you need to do are really both build out your experience and the, the mentoring and, and shadowing someone gives you the opportunity to do that, volunteering to be a tribunal secretary. If, they're, if you're at a law firm and there are partners who are acting as arbitrators, um, volunteering your services for that, volunteering through local, um, bar associations or arbitral institutions, um, getting involved in those institutions and on the committees. Um, it's it's both building your experience and building and and doing the networking to get your name out there and to be exposed to people and um, are the two things that are going to help you get those appointments. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will just summarize saying that um, the advantages of having in-house counsel sitting as arbitrator are so magnificent that it's worth to try it out. So our unique course have paved the way for us by overcoming those challenges and excelling 
as in-house counsel and as arbitrator. Thank you so much, Laura, Ketevan, and Lara for this incredible and insightful discussion on unique unicorns, in-house counsel sitting as arbitrators. We would like to thank our partner organizations, ERA Pledge and the Lagos Chamber of Commerce International Arbitration Center for their invaluable support in making season three possible. We are also truly grateful to the many organizations that support the marketing of our series around the world. Those of you who are watching us over YouTube, our video ends here. Thank you for joining us. To see future ARP in brief videos on handpicked arbitration issues, please follow us on LinkedIn and like and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. We would love to hear your comments and feedback. And please notice that our next episode is scheduled for October 11th featuring Gisela Knotts and Lauren Norman. You can already register on www.arpinbrief.com. We look forward to seeing you there. For those joining us live, we will now have a chance to post a couple of questions to Laura, Ketevan, and Lara in a more interactive way. To join the Q&A, you will need to join a new Zoom webinar using the link just posted in the chat box. See you there. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.